I am excited to introduce someone I haven't seen since her wedding, I think, right? Yep. Literally, your wedding uh, five, six years ago, I guess. Yeah, five, five in a row. Look at that. But this is Catherine Reuter to me, but Catherine Adamek, is that how you pronounce yep. it correctly? Yep. Um, this is someone who, you know, we're at the back end of the Beijing Winter Olympics and the first Olympics I went to with U.S. speed skating was the, Van the Vancouver game. So you were a big part of that team. So uh, I just want to welcome you and say thank you for um, joining me. Thanks for having me. It's great to see you just, you know, because I miss you. I miss hanging out with you. That's the most fun part of sport is having your trainer and your team. And so, yeah, thanks for having me. Yeah. I mean, the camaraderie of a family, um, you know, staff is important, but it's all about the athletes. You know, I do miss you guys because we spent so much time together and we'll get into some of whether it's injury or training or expectations. So the thing is, I was watching the Olympics and I was watching short track and I heard this voice that was familiar. It's been so many years. We don't talk a lot and you've, uh, you've matured i've matured um we've grown up but um hearing you you're polished and stuff but you're working with nbc now can you explain how that happened and and uh, how exciting it is yeah i got i got really lucky i don't i don't know why nbc was without a commentator there's so many people who have filled that role at the games in previous years but this year they were looking for somebody new and Ted Robinson, who's the play by play announcer. Uh, I built a relationship with him in 2010, 14 and again in 18. And so when they needed someone for 22, uh, I know that he kind of put my name in the hat. NBC reached out to my former manager um, who put me in contact and did a couple of interviews and was just introduced to, you know, what does sport look like on the other side of the camera? And I was very fortunate they asked me to call the trials. I've got to fly out to Salt Lake and be there with the Americans when they made the team. Um, and then we actually presented remotely for the Beijing games. Um, NBC did a great job, you know, having some staff in Beijing, some staff in Connecticut. They did a great job just presenting everything um, in, in the new world. But I, I thought it went great. Where were you located during this whole thing? Were you, did you travel to Connecticut at all? So I did not, um, my other, my play-by-play -play guy, Ted Robinson and I, we both ended up calling the races from home. And this was just because of the travel restrictions. And that's the one thing I will say about NBC is that they just, they did a really fantastic job keeping everybody safe and having backup plans whenever they were needed to make sure that they, they really, that they did their job, that they covered the games. They, they brought the games into everyone's homes through their televisions even though we're in the middle of such a such a public health crisis. They, they really had a way to make it all work. As a former athlete, did you talk to the current like US Olympians, the short track um, athletes? Did you, did you actually get a lot of time to discuss what they're going through with them? Um, yeah, so I got to meet with everybody at the trials and meet with them one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, we also did a Zoom interview with all the athletes after the trials was over. And I got to sit in on a press, press conference with the Canadian team. And I will say that while we didn't spend very much time talking about COVID, it has really come to the surface, especially in, in the U.S., the mental health crisis that athletes are going through, the way that uh, Mame Baini is, is who I'll choose as an example at the top of my head, you know, how she can say some people get a bad day. You know how bad that feels. She's open about saying I had three bad years and I didn't want to skate. I was so unhappy. And and I really resonated with that because yeah. it, the the closer you get to the goal, the the less autonomy you have. It's like, I'm right there. I have to do these things. Even if I feel terrible, even if I'm unhappy, I'm, you can't waste the gift. You have to keep going. Um, and I think that's a really difficult headspace to be in, especially for our sport. I think a lot of sports are like this. You move away, you move five States away from home when you're still in your high school years. Um, that's a hard, that's a hard place for a kid to be in. I think we forget a lot of athletes at the games are 21 or younger. Um, they're just, they're just children. <laughs> um, so for them to be going through this mental health and carrying the weight and expectations of performing at an elite level, 
we are seeing a lot of trouble in the mental health side of sport and COVID and all the restrictions around being together is only causing more of that. We've seen, you know, all the media, the fans, everyone focuses often on failures or missed goals. Um, Do you feel like mental health is being, the awareness is up. We know that in all aspects of our society, but it's very upsetting because these are voices that need to be heard it needs to be recognized. Do you think there are significant changes happening that will be for the better moving forward? What I see that's happening for the better is that it's acceptable now to talk about mental health openly in conversation. And, and you were with me during some of my hardest times where I remember my mental health struggle as an athlete and the type of fear that you feel of like, what if I'm not good enough? What if I don't succeed? All of these people have made such great investments in me with their time and their effort and financially. Um, And the fear of letting other people down can be pretty heartbreaking. Um, So on the one hand, what's better is that we can talk about that now. I, I, athletes can go to a coach and say, I'm overwhelmed. I'm anxious. I'm depressed. And coaches are starting to have a language to know how to interact with that athlete. Um, I would say what's not great is that there's still this feeling in the world that if an athlete has mental health issues, they're soft. Yeah. I was going to say weakness. Like traditionally it's like, oh, they're complaining. I remember being, whether it's for you or for anyone, we're kind of your confidant. We work with you. We work between, you know, we work with the coaches, but we're hopefully a buffer and hearing fears and worries and never letting that get to unnecessarily get to coaches and stuff, because it could, it could influence how you're perceived. Uh, Athletes aren't soft. They're humans. Um, Mm -hmm. They should go through a struggle when they're trying to accomplish things that are very new and very difficult and they're surrounded by, you know, a team of expectations and these people that are pushing them, helping them. But it's hard because these are often young athletes, like you said, it can be really upsetting. Let's put it out there then. Okay, I was there for you. Like, you know how much I care about you and I'm proud of you, whether you won crap or not, as long as you try, I'm cool. But it's cool to see medals like you produced, you know, like it's, it, it, it makes us all happy. But, um, looking back like from an accountability what could have what could i have done better for you you know what i mean like you know i tried and we listened but like i think it's reasonable to everyone self-reflect and be like okay maybe we should have just asked more do they need anything you know stuff like that totally so that's something that i've learned as i've gone out of my career as an athlete into my career as a coach uh, and you know Paul Marchese, he's been on your show here. So I'll attribute this to him because this is where I, I learned it. Great coaches don't have the right answers. Great coaches have the right questions. And so you're really nailing it there. And, and that's something that you always had as a strength is just you would try to understand where we were coming from because, you know, whatever we're complaining about, whatever's that's just the surface level. There's yeah. some there's always something deeper. And so I think a positive that, that coaches and support staff and even families, parents need to to know these types of things too. Um, If you have an athlete who's really upset, just being there for them as a human, because the athletes aren't soft, right? We push our bodies to extreme amounts of pain. We convince ourselves that any sacrifice is worth it. And I don't know that someone who hasn't been through that understands what a lonely and self-deprecating road that is all in the name of metals. And to your point, it's great when you produce, but I mean, it's what that was 12 years ago now. And so I'm, I'm happy that I have the tangible success of metals, but I'm also happy that I have the intangible awareness of what it's like when a, a support staff cares about you. Yeah. It doesn't care about your rank, but cares about you as a person. And yeah. that's the most important thing. You know, watching you or anyone go through the process, you learn a lot watching. I'll never be able to understand the pressures you're going through. We can make a judgments or have ideas of what you're going through, but just watching and listening, it becomes pretty obvious that not everything that's bothering you is <laughs> has to do with skating. And But we also know that there's way more to life than speed skating, the Olympics, you know, whatever work, you know? Um, So to have perspective is really important. And um, I do think there's a lot of strides being made. We work in the Boulder, Colorado area. We've had fire shootings in a pandemic and there's mental health support groups that we know personally, friends. 
and it's interesting that like there's a there's a lot of people finally asking for help in athletes people just expect them to be strong and tough and that's not fair it might feel fair in the moment when you're trying to convince a kid i need you to be tough right now because your gold medal race is coming up and i i think there's there's room for that um there is room for that in sport because you know you're making a pitch to your boss or you're going in for a new interview or you're supporting your wife while she's giving birth like there are these big moments where you you can't fall apart right now. You have to be here. You have to perform. We need you. Suck it up. Ha- yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Having that is a life skill. But if that's sure. your only life skill, you're extremely underdeveloped um, as a human. Because yep. you know you are allowed to have bad days. And what I always try to recommend, or I should say, remind athletes is you just need to have a lot of tools. If you're coming to me before a practice um, versus after a practice versus before a game, there's different ways we can respond to what's going on in your life. And the strategy should change based on the stress that you're under. Tell us what you're doing now. I mean, outside of the commentating, tell us what you're spending most of your time with. You're coaching. I know you have your own business. Can you explain your world to us? Yeah, absolutely. So I do, I do two things. Um, one of my things is I work with a youth hockey development program called Scores Edge Hockey. Uh, we do most of our work with a local AAA team called the Milwaukee Junior Admirals. Uh, and I really enjoy that work because I'm with athletes and I am teaching mental toughness skills in real time. Um, it's very gratifying for me to practice the positive coaching skills that, that I've learned throughout the years that I really wish a coach had known how to show to me. So I take a lot of pride in that. I work with athletes, their parents, as well as their coaches on the physical side of sport, but also on the mental side of sport. And then I have my own consulting business where I do, I do public speaking um, engagements, but I also maintain private clients who, again, they just want to develop performance mindset. And what I try to remind people is you don't have to be competing for an Olympic medal to struggle with performance anxiety or to need more confidence or to understand motivation. These are life skills. Athletes get to learn them with their sports psychs. That's very special and unique to athlete world. But this type of stress and pressure athletes are under, it's everywhere. It's a it's not an athlete problem. It's a human problem. Uh, So I really enjoy sharing the strategies, not just with athletes, but all walks of life. It applies to most everyone, right? Yeah. I mean, that's, that's how we felt. Most we people are like, well, I'm not an athlete, but I have an injury. I'm like, there, what I do can be applied to most people, but that sounds really, um, I don't know, enjoyable for you. It's great to see you do something you're passionate about. What made you lead into what you're doing? What inspiration or what motivation did you have? Yeah. When I first got started, Um, I just kind of needed a transition period out of sport uh, into the real world. So coaching was the obvious choice for that. Um, Over the last couple of years, I've I've gained so much experience because I don't know that that this is well known, but when you're an athlete, you might work an eight hour day, but your job is to warm up, work out, cool down, eat food, see the trainer and take a nap. Yeah. And then you yeah. leave athlete world and you go into a world where I'm supposed to sit on a computer six to eight hours a day. Uh, I'm supposed to react to the demands of people around me. I'm supposed to be available with my time to anyone who needs it. And yep. having boundaries, when you're an athlete, you don't have to set your own boundaries. You literally just show up and do your job. And then coming out of athlete life into the real world, having the experience as a coach has helped me understand how does the mental toughness skills that I learn as an athlete, how do they transition into real life? Because I'm not pushing through a 30 lap set anymore. I'm pushing through a 30 slide presentation that sure. I have to give in an hour, sure. but the mental skills are still the same. Awesome. Can we go back to uh, those, those times during Vancouver and before? Cause sure. um, you had in sports medicine, we're so interested in recovery, injury diagnosis, management, but a lot of, um, a lot of things attribute the, the years, the miles, the laps to a lot of this repetitive use. But can you kind of go over some of the injuries you dealt with? And I'll, I'll chime in at some point, but can you review yeah. some of that? Yeah, for sure. So my first major injury, uh, was, I was in high school, I needed a knee surgery. 
uh, on my right knee. And that was really kind of the start of my body's imbalance. Yep. Uh, after about five years training at an elite level, I got my first FAI surgery on my right hip. Yeah. I made it back to a world championship level, had the best season I'd ever had, but I fell in my best distance and you were there. I think you remember that yeah. was really hard on me. Yeah. Um, so I, I did not get the coveted overall world champ win. I fell in my best distance instead. And, and that led to two more hip surgeries, which led to herniated discs, uh, which eventually just led to me saying, I'll just coach. I don't, I, I hurt too bad. I don't want to go through this <laughs> yeah. anymore. Um, I did make a little bit of a comeback for the 2018 games. My, I rehabbed, I focused on my food and my, my recovery. And I really built up my social network so that I had a chance of feeling confident um, yep. in who I was. That's something I really lost when I didn't have medals anymore to show how good enough I was. I had to rebuild that. And that was that was really freaking difficult. Sure. Um, but as I started to build that up, I got healthier and my, my pain went away. So I tried to make a comeback to the sport. Um, I got, I fell and got a concussion. So the injuries just kept moving on. Um, but now since I stopped skating after 2018, I did a couple years of functional fitness, uh, mostly through CrossFit and really even my body out for the first time ever. I didn't realize I was extremely strong on the left, weak on the right, extremely strong in my lower, weak in my upper. So just functionally, I didn't have functional fitness. Sure. Um, so once I built that back up, now I'm back into yoga. I do yoga every day. I also for hot, I do hot yoga and that's like my workout yoga, but nice. I also have my, my slower, you know, vinyasa, slow yes. flow. Sure. Yes, exactly. Um, and so really, I feel like a lot of my injuries came from being out of balance, whether that's physically out of balance, but also mentally and emotionally and spiritually out of balance. Um, and I've really gotten to the point where I'm, I'm not pain free, but it's so much better now. And I do attribute a lot of that to you, Eric. Oh, great. Thank you. <laughs> I remember I did a functional evaluation on all of you guys when I first got there. I, I think I, I joined you guys maybe three or four weeks before Olympic trials and yep. um, JR like cut off his leg. Essentially. It was like a, the whole, the whole team was kind of like had a lot going on, but, um, yep. but we did a functional evaluation and, and it turned out, I would ask like coaches and everyone like who has great technique. And it turned out the people who had the best technique in short track also were the most imbalanced like their body had changed. So you talk to a PT sports med world and they're often like the person has to be perfectly about or perfectly balanced. And you're like, well, what happens if they turn left all day? They, they're they not going, it's not about health and wellness. Skating is about performance. So it's interesting that I noticed just people were fairly imbalanced. They tended to have better technique. What do you think of that? Did you feel, you did you know you're a, you were out of balance physically, but you were probably supporting your technique more. Yes. I yeah. remember before you came, I had, I had already had, you came before my first hip surgery and I already had a lot of pain. And the, the trainer previous to me, I asked, Hey, what can I do? And she said, Oh, you'll need a hip replacement someday. And that was all the help I got. And then you came <laughs> and you showed me, Oh, you can do, you taught me, I use it every day when I yoga how to keep my core braced while I do a cat cow. Cause I used to just dump into my hips and, and rib flare. Sure. And no wonder my back would hurt all the time. Um, awesome. but yeah, just being yeah. taught, you know, how to, how to move properly. You said it perfectly. When you get to a place in your fitness that it's not functional, it's performance-based. Yes. You are going to start seeing the imbalance because the specificity of sport especially a sport like speed skating requires some imbalance. Yep. Um, what I would say about that now, I do have my CrossFit level one. I, that's the best training I've ever done for my body. It requires you to be balanced left, right, top, bottom, center, everything. Sure. Um, so, and that's what I do now when I coach the athletes I do work with, we try to do a lot of functional movements. Um, and I do try to incorporate a lot of yoga because I genuinely believe um, you know, even if you have these imbalances that are sport specific, we have off ice for a reason. There yeah. are, there are plenty of opportunities to balance your body 
coaches and athletes just need to know how. Yep. I think having a strong foundational functional ability is so important. And I remember you particularly, um, you know, it was like the motion you had, we wanted to be as clean and as free as possible. And we want more motion usually, but you were, I mean, you were ramping up towards the games. Uh, we weren't that far away and you were just pushing and pushing and pushing. You know, the when you talk about hip impingement, femoral acetabular hip impingement, FAI, I remember in Marquette, I think it was World Cup four, you, yep. you fell, you slammed the boards. Marquette doesn't have the forgiving pad system. It's like concrete with 16 inches of pads. And you were like in a seated position. I might be wrong. And you like slid in backwards. Mm -hmm. And then from there, it was like, oh, the spine got jolted. The SI joints were, they should be irritated, but your left hip was it was really mm -hmm. bothering you. Yeah. And it was like, now we had one hell of a challenge of like, just in, in not convincing you that you feel good, but like, okay, you're structurally sound enough to train and compete but you took a shot. Was that kind of the biggest hit up until that date that then projected you on this path of hip injury and such? That was the day that my left leg became functionally shorter than my right leg for probably about three years. Sure. Up until that point, I could, I could see the trainer, I could do my exercises and, and I could fix it. But after that fall, my left hip was permanently hiked up to the point where we we adjusted my left blade. We made my left blade taller than my right leg so that when I was skating, I couldn't feel it. And we adjusted the sole in my left shoe so that, but we weren't addressing the problem. You know, we were, we were Bandit. giving me crutches. Yes. To yeah. allow me to finish the Olympic season. But it was, it was three years after that fall until I could skate again, pain-free. And so what would that have been? That would have been about 2013. It was longer than that. I didn't skate pain-free again until 2016, I would say. Damn. Um, so yeah, several years until I felt like I could go back at a competent level to my sport. And I'll tell you, I still, to this day, this is why I CrossFit. This is why I yoga, because I still have imbalances that they don't just hurt my body. They hurt my mind. Uh, when I get anxious, when I get stressed, I have my speed skater shoulder, <laughs> my right <laughs> shoulder. It goes right up to my ear and I get all this pain, but, but it also creates mental stress. Um, and even though the, the pain's not in my head, physical pain manifests in anxiety or vice versa, anxiety in manifests in my physical pain. So, so I work really hard now to, to be balanced. And that's something I learned from my athletic career. You know, there's no secret to success. Success is doing the things, you know, you're supposed to do. Sure. You know, you're supposed to meditate, you know, you're supposed to stretch and foam roll and, and all the things, you no know, way. you're supposed to go to bed yeah. on time, right? Like when you're doing the things you feel better and that's not a fun process. Let yeah. me take that back. That process is simple, but it's not easy. And sure. it is fun when you get it right, but it's not fun when you're down on yourself and feeling upset. When you talk about mental health or psych, when we were in Vancouver, you got fourth, right? And, and so then and that was pretty early on. I think you then crashed. I'm trying to remember the specifics, but, and then in the 15, doo -doo -doo, no, in the thousand, then you're up against men Wang. that struggle through the games, you know, like we watch you, we know you're probably stressed because you have expectations for yourself. Um, what was it like getting fourth and then having to wait a period of time? I think in between that you, you didn't get as close as you want, but you had to wait some time before you actually got your last chance um, before the relay, but an individual race yeah. and you pulled out silver. What was that like? I mean, was it a struggle or was it, could you handle that? No, it, it was a struggle um, for sure. The fourth place really hurt my feelings a lot because I, I was a I was a gold medal contender in that race. It was the first race of the games, 1500. Um, I had, I had a realistic performance goal of winning gold. I goofed up with like four laps to go, ended up in last place. And I, I, I recovered. I went from ninth to fourth in four laps, but yeah, not ninth to first. Yeah. So that in itself was difficult. Um, my family really loved me through that. I, would, I thought my family might be a little upset because, 
people do spend a lot of time and energy and finances yeah. on the athletic career, but my family just loved me right through that process. Um, That's and great. I, I, yeah. What was their shirt? Reuters what? What, what was the Ruben green shirt? Reuter. Yeah, Ruben Ruben for Reuter. Yeah, Ruben for Reuter. Awesome. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, go ahead. Um, so my family got me through that time. I just talked with Ted Robinson about this when one, one of the times we were on break this is past couple of weeks that yep. it wasn't until I won the individual silver in the thousand, which was the last day of competition, um, that I realized I hadn't been breathing. And I don't, I don't know that I breathed my whole life up until that point. Yeah. I had such a weight on my shoulders. You have to get the medal. And then I got one and all of a sudden I could breathe. And that was really eye-opening. I had no idea how much stress and pressure I had been carrying within me until I had the medal. And, and that opened a whole new can of worms because, you know, now I have this tangible thing that says I'm good enough, but that wears off. Tangible things wear off. So that's where the mental skills part comes in. Do you have the mental fortitude to believe in yourself with or without good results? Um, and that's what I try to do now is help people figure out what that feels like. That that's um, empowering to have tools and skills to do that, to help people, but also to take care of yourself with long track going on. I got to travel with them recently. And so you have people like Brittany Bowe and Joey Mantia, obviously Aaron Jackson, like showed up and did great, but uh, seeing them win medals, um, we don't talk too much about it, but like, I know it means a lot to them. I'm so proud of them. I feel like a weight lifted a little bit for them because um, they should be proud no matter what. But uh, hearing you say that, it's like you finally were breathing. That last, that silver medal race, I remember right after you were so excited and jazz and the pictures show it because you're just beaming. Um, I remember you telling me, and correct me if I'm wrong, but you were like, Eric, I wanted gold in some version of this, but then you were going to make a move and what you had gone through in the other races, you were like, I was going to make a move. And she seemed to always be kind of in the way. Yeah. You were like, you didn't concede anything, but you, yeah. you just, you, you followed the race, how it gave you or what it gave you. And in the end, you're like, you know, silver is really beautiful. And I was like, so happy for you because s such success is, is great to see. But can you talk about that? Like that last, yeah. th that last race? Yeah, I don't, I actually didn't learn this lesson until the 500 meter at the game. So the 1500 was first, yep. wanted to win and didn't, got fourth. 500 meter was next. And in the semifinal, I saw my opportunity and I, I thought, I know exactly how to do this. And what you do in speed skating when you want to make a pass is you have to step out wide so that you have room to build up. The moment I stepped out to my right, someone passed me on my left. And in less than a 10th of a second, I went in my head from, oh, I'm making this final. My hole is right there to yep. I'm in last place. <laughs> How did that happen so quickly? Yeah. Um, and I, I was a good racer. I was not used to people being able to just kind of pick me off due to a strategic error. And so then having gone through that in the 500, going into the thousand was the same thing. I have enough energy to step out and accelerate, but if I do, um, I might get gold, but I might get bronze versus if I defend my position first, yeah. uh, I know I'll get a silver and, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm more or less okay with the decision that I yeah. made the athlete behind me. She would not have allowed me to make a slip. She would have taken that silver position away from me. Yep. at any moment. And I did make the choice that I'm going to defend before I pass. Um, and that's just the way that it went. Yeah. There, there's so much, um, risk in short track. So it's not like, you know, you conceded or it's just, that's what happened in the race and you made, you know, you made your move and you, you held your position. So that was such an exciting time because you were just running around with the flag and it was like, man, like, yeah. you know, I said, there's more to life than sport and Olympics and medals, but it is nice to see, you know, people reach a place where they're really happy. And that was, yeah. that was really exciting. I'll tell you what it feels like 
quick. So first of all, when you cross the finish line or when I crossed the finish line and I realized what I had done, sure. it felt like someone had plugged my toes into an electrical socket. Like wow. in my head, my hair was standing out on end and just the energy was not able to stay inside of me. It was an incredible feeling. That's awesome. Um, yeah. And then after that, running around afterwards, what it feels like is like, it's like you won a golden ticket of like the five Willy Wonka chocolate bars in the entire universe. You got one of the five. And, <laughs> and it is, it's a fun feeling. And, you know, to your point, it wasn't the medal that gave me that feeling. It was the accomplishment. It was the pride in myself. It was the team that I shared it with. Those emotions were incredibly real. And I carry them with me to this day. Um, back then, I didn't realize that the ability to feel good about yourself was separate from whether or not you had an Olympic medal. Now, you, you ended up winning a bronze in the relay, but if there was a mixed relay back then, oh. what did, you know, like that, like, because everyone in 2010 won an Olympic medal. Mm -hmm. I mean, that had never been done in U.S. speed skating. Uh, that whole Olympics, I mean, the Team USA just most medals ever in Canada. We just, everyone did well. It was so exciting. Uh, we went to Sochi and it was a little bit different of an experience. No, um, I don't, I limit my expectations because they're something I can't control how people perform, mm -hmm. but um, Vancouver was so exciting. If you had a mixed relay, you think that would have been a medal? You think you had 100%. a legit team? Yeah. yeah, we had Apollo and JR and I mean, I, I like to think that I was pretty good back in my day and I had some really nice teammates backing me up. Like for sure, there were plenty of girls that would have been a good addition to a mixed team relay. Sure. Um, so yeah, good point, man. Ugh, yeah. Missed out. <laughs> when I heard that, I was like, what? Like the Stephen yeah. uh, Goff had mentioned it. I didn't like catch it. And then when I went back, I was like, there is a mixed relay. That's crazy. Mm -hmm. Um what's happening in short track? Like we, you know, I talked to Paul Marchese and we talked to Steve about like, they're having pre-bent blades, technology, the, just the speeds. We talked to Eric Hayden about like this stuff. Um, do you see anything else happening in short track that make it, makes it more exciting or makes it safer or anything in technology? You know, this might not be directly related to equipment technology, but I think that, I think people are getting smarter and smarter about how they fuel their body. And a change that Kristen Santos has made is she's gone from a vegetarian diet to a completely plant-based diet. Um, and I know that that's not technological, but it is this idea of like, where can you find your tenths of a second? Where can you be 1% better? Because that is what we're talking about at this, at this level of sport. Um, when you can work on that externally through your equipment, that's great. But when you can work on that internally through yeah, well, your mental health, but just through your ability to take care of yourself. Are you foam rolling before bed? Are you stretching in the morning? Um, are you eating the right things, limiting your caffeine, alcohol, whatever it is, like our vices, you know? Sure. Uh, Kristen really went above and beyond to control her controllables and say like food is one of the things that I can, I can get a few more percentage points here. And I think that's uh, a way that athletes are continuing to just push the bar and think outside of the box to improve their performance. It's science. So, you know, whether it's technology or not, it makes a difference. And when you le when you reach that level of performance, you have to find, you have to squeak out more performance. And uh, mm -hmm. can you talk about her? Obviously her um, games are over at this point, right? Um, mm -hmm. Everyone's proud of her. She came from a, a figure skating background. Can you talk about Kristen Santos and uh, what the future yeah. looks like for her? Yeah. So I remember the first junior world team that I was the team leader for. This is after I had my first surgery. I wasn't competing. U.S. speed skating. Hey, do you want to, you know, go be the team leader for this group of kids? And she was on that team. And what I really enjoy about Kristen Santos is that she did not peak in her teenage years. Speed skating is a sport where people tend to get good pretty young she followed a long-term athletic development process. She was a full-time student, uh, I think up until, gosh, I think she just recently graduated with her degree. Yeah. Um, so she's, she has good friends. She's got a loving fiance, two dogs, a, a degree. She keeps herself balanced. And when she was on this junior team, when she's 18, 19 years old, 
the thought was, you know, this, this, this athlete isn't committed enough there that she's not on the ice six days a week. How can she possibly succeed? But then, you know, she slowly, but surely got more and more focused over the years. And she reached this same point at 27 that I reached at age 21. And yeah, sure. She, now she's going to have to go four more years if she wants to bring home a medal. Um, but you know, she also hasn't had three hip surgeries and a knee surgery. She doesn't have these chronic pain issues that I had because I pushed my timeline so short. Um, and I think that she's modeling the new way for athletics is focus on the human potential, the long-term athletic development model allows people to, um, develop fully, not just in this one way and sure. she's modeling what that can look like and that you can still have high performance following that model. Yeah, because, you know, sports medicine, sports science isn't about just exploiting every opportunity. It's about managing this person. So the Russian um, figure skater, you know, there's criticisms mm -hmm. from the from everyone about like these young athletes kind of top out there. You know, they they haven't fully matured. Do you think athletes moving forward are going to be able to compete into older ages um, in the 30s because they're going to be managed better or they have better teams? around them? I think a lot of that has to do with funding um, because there is a certain point where I I'll say this, I don't know Kristen's plans beyond the fact that I know she wants to be a physical therapist. So she has her bachelor's degree. Yep. Um, but when you're 27 and you're thinking the next, I can train for another four years and it's going to hurt. <laughs> it's going to physically hurt my body and probably physically hurt my brain a little bit also but I could get medals. So that's one option. The other option is I need to get a two-year master plus a PhD, and then I can get to work and I can earn money. So I, I really think it comes down to how long do we expect an athlete to keep chasing the dream before they embrace the rest of their life? Because I didn't know when I stopped skating, like I woke up very abruptly. Oh my God, I have 60 more years on this earth. What am I going to do next? Sure. Yeah. And I think Kristen's at an age at 27 where she needs to decide, does she want to go four more years? Is there enough funding to make it worth her time? Or is yep. she better off to develop outside of the sport? Do you think there needs to be a remodeling of the whole funding experience? Um, you know, there's GoFundMe type pages and, and resources. Um, you know, I read about you on your Wikipedia, just like at 16, you moved to, or was it 16? You moved to Salt Lake on your own dime and, and your different like local groups um, help sponsor you. And, and that's like a very common story, you know, mm -hmm. um, at least I think so. Do you think there needs to be some overhaul or is there an opportunity for athletes to be sponsored in a more meaningful way? Yeah, I do think an overhaul is necessary. Um, I, I had a lot of support from US speed skating because I first moved away before, uh, before the economic crisis in 2008. So before that time, pay to play sports wasn't something I was familiar with. Sure, like I, I paid my own car uh, and my own gas and I bought my own meals when I ate out, but a lot of my things, my room, my board, my coaching, my ice time, those things were covered by the US Olympic Committee. After 2008, a lot of the sponsor dollars just fell away. Um, and then Stephen Colbert came in. No. Stephen Colbert came in. Yes, <laughs> yeah, yeah. exactly. Exactly. But even outside of the, yeah. at that point, I was at the performance level, at the grassroots level, after that financial crisis, now families have to pay for coaching. Families have to pay for ice time and, and for all the things that go along with being an elite athlete. So to answer your question in a, a bit of a creative way, number one thing that I would say for any athlete who wants to earn a living while they're competing in their sport, get into coaching. It will make you a significantly better athlete and it will give you the life experience you need to have a smooth transition when you're ready to be done with sport. Um, and there's really easy ways to do it. You can get nutrition certifications, strength and conditioning certifications. There's mental skills cert courses out there now. Uh, take your pick, right? And just, just get started. Um, and so I would, I would actually lean into that as a way for athletes to earn a living instead of getting hyped up on the sponsor dollars. The sponsor dollars are so hard to come by. Um, yeah. I, well, it's possible. I mean, I did it. I know lots of athletes who do do it, 
but I would look more to the first issue of how do we scale back from pay to play sports? Cause I, that, that's an interesting psychological issue that you put onto someone um, regarding their yeah. worth and their value in sport when there's so much money wrapped up in it. But then in addition to that, you don't, from the athlete perspective, there are things that athletes can do to support themselves without saying, well, you know, US speed skating is not paying me enough. USOC isn't paying me enough. My family doesn't have enough money and they're not helping enough. Like athletes can do things to support themselves. Yeah. That's, you know, you hear it in um, the penitentiary system. You hear it in uh, military. When these people come back into real life, they need skills. They need to be mm -hmm. able to support themselves. And I think that is creative rather than trying to find, it's not handout, but like trying to find more money that's given. It's just give them something that's tangible that they can um, not only have hope, but like they have a, they have something to look forward to. That's a healthier, healthier individual. If they're a coach related to sport, they actually have something to apply to their actual training. Cause the, you know, most of the best athletes we work with have educated themselves like on their own time. Yep. And that's where, you know, you can be older, you can be 30 years old and you've gone through a lot and you just have had to figure it out that that works, but also finding some education and something applicable to your future, as well as your present sport. That would be cool. Yeah. Uh, short track trains all day. So like, yeah. you know, I know there's no time for school, right? Like yes, traditional I'm school. Is that true? Correct. That's, yeah. that's, that's mostly true. Like I said, Kristen did it, but Kristen, Kristen was very purposeful about getting her schoolwork done first. I admire her for doing that, but an athlete traditionally takes the path of, I'm not going to be young forever. Let me focus on sport now and go back to school later. But yeah, you end up being in your thirties just for the first time, starting to understand traditional life skills. Athlete life does require very specific and difficult athlete skills. Only about 20% of them come with you into the real world. I learned that in a very slow and painful way. Uh, and I think that there's an, a lot of athletes who maybe never figure that out. So giving people tools to make their transition more easy early on, it can support them financially. It can support them from a performance perspective, and it sets them up for their life, not just for their sport. Man, what's the future look like for you then? Like, wh what's going to happen? I know you always said you wanted 12 kids or something, but uh, no. <laughs> Did I say that? I no, not at all. <laughs> I just made it up. Uh, what does the future look like? Is this something that commentating, is this really what you're going to be moving forward and, and do what you do? Yeah, I don't think there's enough opportunity in the speed skating world for a commentating career. I have really enjoyed it. And if, if I have opportunities to work for NBC in the future, I definitely will. Cause it, it has been really, really fun. Um, but I actually start next week, a trauma coaching recovery course. Uh, it's about a six month program. Something that I've become very interested in is how do you teach mental health without sacrificing performance? I do want to eliminate this idea that athletes needing mental help is soft. Um, athletes are humans, humans have emotions, humans can cry before they can talk. It's okay. There is crying in baseball. It's fine. Uh, yep. I want to like help spread that message. I want to help athletes understand, uh, how to do what they need to do. But what I really want to help is coaches to understand, um, how do you teach these life lessons? How do you encourage athletes to trust themselves, to encourage their teammates, to be grateful for opportunities this does not mean working less hard. This does not mean sacrificing less. This means having mental toughness skills to do what you do even more effectively. Do you think uh, if we have coaches and everyone, all the support staff, just more emotionally available? I mean, let's be frank. Most of the coaches are men. Men generally aren't emotionally available, right. uh, but um, that's changing, you know? And uh, do you think we're close if coaches could gain skills from like what you're going to be working on in your career. Um, there could be a really positive change in how we look at youth sports, professional sports, Olympic sports. Do you agree with that? Absolutely. I think it's really just a matter of education. Um, I've got a mentor I work with right now, Dr. Mick, Rick McGuire. He's a sports psychologist. 
And, and he has this great analogy. He says, Catherine, if you had an athlete come to you in the weight room saying, I cut my finger, I need a bandaid, give him a bandaid the next day. Oh, I cut my finger again. You'd think, oh, that's weird, but fine. Here's a bandaid on the third or the fourth or the fifth day. You'd be like, yo kid, what's going on? Why are you cutting yourself? But we're seeing that in the mental health side where athletes show up day after day after day, anxious, depressed, acting out, um, being negative, chirping their teammates. And it's time for coaches to say, hey, there's a theme here. Instead of handing out Band-Aids, let's help the kids stop getting hurt. Uh, and that's what coaches need to do. And I think that's just a matter of education. Every coach I know is in the field for the right reasons. Uh, but I don't think that the mental side of sport from the coach's perspective has been taught enough to help our coaches support our athletes. Well, in eight or 12 years when you're the U.S. national team coach <laughs> and I grill you over this, I'm like, okay, have we implemented the things we're talking about? It would be a fun conversation to have. And, uh... Only if you're the team trainer. Oh, yeah. I might be <laughs> retired by then. That would be cool. Okay. <laughs> you know, my time with you guys was uh, so entertaining and um, a challenge, but um, exciting and such great memories. You know, like you look back, some things can be so difficult and challenging that they're not miserable. They're just like almost overwhelming. And you, you learn a lot about yourself, how to like handle the pressure or the expectations and the big thing is interacting with other people. Coaches are under a lot of pressure to perform. And even if they're mm -hmm. good people, like any person, we tend to project our fears and our everything on in, in sport. It can be a young athlete. And maybe it's yeah. not like a, too aggressive, but it can be chronic. It can mm -hmm. be passive aggressive, mm -hmm. or it could just be inconsistent. And uh, it would be exciting to see that these changes are you know, we, we see this in medicine. There's a lot of physicians and providers that just aren't available for their patients. And you talk to the providers and they're just like, I am under certain pressures. I don't have the skills or the time to do what I want to do. It's not personal. Mm -hmm. um, I wonder if it's the same way in sport. I think it kind of is, but. 100%, because it is how people make their living. And I, I make a living in youth sports. I have an ethical concern with that. Um, the way that I, the way that I work on that is I focus on humans first. I don't coach athletes. I coach humans with athletic tendencies. I show them how to be high performers in and outside of their sport. Um, but I do think that there are, I, I know because I'm in development, uh, it's less high pressure than someone who might get fired if they have a losing season. And I kind of mentioned this before, where when we, when we layer too much of the finances on top the goal gets blurry. Is the goal to win medals and earn more funding? Or is the goal to help an athlete have a phenomenal experience and achieve the best they can achieve in sport? It's obviously option two. Sure. The money just clouds that. Um, and I think that comes from an even higher level than coaching staff. That comes from our administrators. That comes from our national governing bodies, the USOPC, to start getting creative with how are we incentivizing? How are we um, make signing contracts? Are we making these financial decisions with the athletes' best interests in mind? And until the people who hire and make those decisions are thinking about athletes, uh, the coaches are going to have a hard time setting aside their livelihood to focus on what's best for athletes. Sure, sure. One last question for you, a very serious question, is if... Uh... If mass start existed, would you have considered long track? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Yeah. I didn't skate mass start until I started coaching and I just did it one day for fun. We were had a weekend off. We went to the Pettit and all the short trackers participated in a mass start event. And yes, I absolutely would have had more longevity. I would have done my short track career and then hopped on over to long track for the mass start. It would have been fun. That's but, okay. uh, well, uh, thank you so much. If I head out to the Pettit Center, I might ask you to come meet yes. me. I'm going to do a bunch of documentaries. It'll be fun to uh, learn more about speed skating as it develops over the next few years. But I'm really proud of you. I'm happy for you. you uh, you're you going to make a difference in a lot of people's lives. And just like my patients, I don't care if they're an athlete. They have performance needs like they need to work. They need mm -hmm. to get functional. 
And I just dig that, whether it's a medal or not, or, you know, I just want people to reach the goals that they need for their life. And uh, it, it, it makes me feel good about what I do. And I know you probably feel the same way. So uh, Thank you. thanks for helping people and in being involved in such an important aspect of sport and life. And um, great to see you. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. This has yeah. been great. Uh, let's, let's hang out in person next time. Hell yeah.